everything that you deserve. It isn't about us and how we feel. It's about you. It's about you, God. So we just want to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>
everything can.
Forever all my days I will love you, God right here with us. We have to keep our eyes fixed on him and not on what's happening around us.
Father, we just thank you that you are for us and you're not against us. And we just declare whoever needs to hear that today, that God is for you. He's absolutely for you. No matter what's going on in your life, he's absolutely for you. For those people that think that God's mad at them, God isn't mad at you. He's absolutely for you. And his goodness and his mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And the goodness of God is always on the table when it concerns you and your life. No matter what you're facing, the goodness of God is always on the table. God, we thank you that you are for us. You are always for us. God, we thank you for your peace in our life. We thank you for the blessing that you pour out upon us. God, we thank you for the safety that you provide for us from things that we're not even aware of. God, we thank you for the blessings that you pour out on us, and let's just be honest, we don't deserve them, but you're good to us. God, I thank you for loving us the way that you do. God, I thank you for just pouring your love out in every area of our life. God, we praise you and say that you're a good God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. How are you guys doing? We're going to prepare to receive, not or, or not receive our tithe and offerings. We'll do that later. We're going to get ready to do communion. But before we do communion, I want to just go back and do something that we did a couple weeks ago. Um, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the wins. In every staff meeting, we talk about the wins for the week, um, what we uh, had winning um, from this week, and keep our mindset on what God's done for us and what He's doing. And I always look at the negative things, the things that we're struggling with. And so I just want to open it up for just a couple minutes. Who has a win from the week that you guys want to share? Just super fast. You don't have to like come up. You can just shout it out. Anybody have a win from the week? What do you got, Tom? Or Tim? Nice. For those who didn't hear it, he was trying to sell his house and ran into some snags, and God put him in the connection with the right person who, who gave him the answers they needed. So when do you close? Have you closed yet? But smooth sailing from here on out? Nice. That's a win. Who else has a win? Cornhole tournament, Cornhole tournament was a huge win yesterday. Fantastic. Yes. That was a big, a big success. That was a huge win. So that's a great win. Who else has a win? What's God done in your life this week? What's God, what's Blaine? Nice. So God can turn all things out for your good. He turned food poisoning into $400, huh? All right. That's fair. <laughs> that's a win in my book. Who else has a win? Anybody else had food poisoning and God turned it into money? That's a good deal. I, don't, I, might, I might eat questionable food if I knew that was going to be the outcome for it. So <laughs> Anybody else have a win for the week? The rest of you have bad weeks? Waking up. Waking up. What do you got, Trina? Ah, uh, some puzzle pieces. God's connecting the dots for you. That's awesome. And some wilderness scenes of your life. That's fantastic. I love hearing the stories because I think sometimes we can come into church and sometimes we feel like we're the only person that ever has real issues. Like everybody else's life is, you know, candy land and, you know, rainbows and puppy dog tails. And, and the reality is, is we all struggle with stuff. We all have wilderness seasons and we all have, you know, food poisoning and snags in the road when we're trying to close our house. And we all have those issues. And it's great to come together because the Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and what? The word of his testimony, word of our testimony. So how, what God's done in our life and what he's what the, how he's working. So I just love to hear and just let faith arise from hearing what people have to say about what God's done in their life. So thanks for sharing on the wins. So 
uh, we're going to go ahead and get ready for communion. And uh, I just wanted to read one little verse because we're talking about defeating our giants this week or this series. And so I want to just read a verse in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. And it says, I'm sorry, verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when we take communion... We really take it because it's a, it's a picture or, or it's a reminder of the covenant that we have between God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And it's an everlasting covenant that you and I can't mess up or undo. And it says that Jesus' name reigns supreme. And so no matter what giant is in your life, no matter what issue you're facing, no matter what you've named your giant, that giant will fall at the name of Jesus, and it has to bow its name to the name of Jesus. And so I want to take communion today with you guys having in mind that uh, whatever giant that you guys are facing this week, um, the blood and the body of Christ guarantees that that giant falls. Like I told you last week that every giant falls. There's not one giant that doesn't fall at some point in time, and the reason they all fall is because of the covenant that we have with Jesus Christ and that what he did with, the, with the, uh, his blood on the cross. And so I want to just invite you guys to come share with us. We have um, communion up here. I thought we had the prepackaged cups. Where are those at, Lori? Oh, they're in the back. So if you want prepackaged cups, they're in the back. You can f- feel free to do that. If I could have two, two couples come up and help me serve. I saw Dana. Dana, you want to come up here with your mom and serve? Would that be all right? Multi-generational blessing on that side, huh? Paul, you and Kelly want to come up and help serve? And how we uh, practice uh, communion here at the church is... You don't have to be a member of the body of Christ, or you don't have to be a member of the church here. You have to be a member of the body of Christ. So we will encourage that you are a believer in Jesus and you can partake here. That's no problem at all. I'm going to pray over the elements. If you would prefer to have um, the elements up here, feel free to come get them. If you want the prepackaged ones there in the back, make sure you help yourself to those. If you have someone um, near you that is, uh, can't get up or can't move easily, make sure that you offer to get them some and make sure that uh, if there's anyone that doesn't have someone to partake with, that you invite them into your group or your family and make sure that everybody has someone that they can partake of the communion with. So I'm going to pray after that. You guys are free to come up, get this, or you can get the prepackaged things in the back. So Father, we thank you for the day. God, we thank you for the ability to come before your throne boldly because of the blood of Jesus and because of his sacrifice on the cross. God, we thank you for the covenant that we're part of, and we declare that every name will bow to the name of Jesus, that our giants will fall that they're guaranteed to fall. No giant stands forever. So God, as we take communion today, we take it with the thought that you've already bought victory for us. We're working from victory and not for victory, and that you're for us and not against us. And so God, we thank you. We ask your blessings on this time. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys are free to come partake.
Okay, if you guys are not quite done, feel free to take all the time you need. We're going to go ahead and prepare to receive our tithes and offerings and give you guys an opportunity to sow into the kingdom here at the well. And so if you're new to giving here, there are a number of ways that you can give here at the well. There is envelopes in the seat back in front of you. If you prefer to give cash, feel free to put that in there. If you want a tax credit, make sure you put your name on that. Uh, you can write checks out, make them out to the well, as well as you can visit online. If you visit the, our website at life at the church, you can give online. And finally, our preferred way for you to give is through text giving. If you've never done that, uh, it's super easy. Follow the prompts on the screen behind me if you've never done that, and it'll get you set up on the account and how to do that. So that's our preferred way, but feel free to give in whichever way is easiest for you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray. After that, you guys are free to come give your checks and your cash. There's baskets on my left and on my right. Feel free to put those in there and make sure on your way back that you uh, say hi to somebody and make sure the visitors are welcomed and uh, that we connect with them. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day. God, we thank you for an opportunity to come before you and give. God, we ask your blessings on our giving. God, we thank you for being generous to us. Your word says that uh, there's, always an, there's always grace in our life to be generous in every season. And so, Lord, we know that we can be generous in every season and that you can bless whatever we give and, and however we're doing in our life. So we just ask that you would bless every household here, that you would provide more than enough for us to be a blessing to one another and to advance your kingdom. God, we thank you for what you're doing here in our community and our church. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys are free to give. Good morning. Good morning. We are so happy that all of you are here today. And that. So, for everyone that came out to the uh, cornhole tournament, we want to thank everybody. We had it was an amazing success yesterday. Um, we have we don't have full exact numbers yet, but uh, rough numbers. Well over two thousand dollars was raised. So, everyone, give yourself a pat. God was amazing and really provided, so thank you, everyone that donated, everyone that came and supported. John, we want to give you a big thank you because you worked your tail off and got a ton of donations, and it was a huge, huge success, so thank you. Um, everybody else that donated gift cards, um, prizes, again, thank you. A couple of announcements. Um, if you are a first-time visitor, you can reach our connection card by scanning the QR code that is in the seat back in front of you. You can also get to our app if you haven't downloaded it, and that's, our app is a great way to keep connected with the church. 
Our annual business meeting will be Sunday, March 21st, following the service. That is a very short meeting, and it's where we will be going over all of the financials from last year. There will be a small group starting on April 6th that is going to be led by Paul Nelson, and it is actually going to be held over at Eagle Summit, and that the uh, small group is living, living from the presence. Um, they're going to discover how to increase your awareness of the Holy Spirit's presence, release the atmosphere of heaven into your spheres of influence, and experience new levels of God's glory, and witness an increase of signs, wonders, and miracles. So that's going to be a great small group. Unfortunately, it is already booking up um, just by word of mouth. So there is only a few spots available. Um, so if you are interested in that, the cost is $25. Talk to Paul. He's the guy with the big gray beard right here. Um, or you can contact Eagle Summit. Um, if that fills up, we will be running it again. So um, if you're not able to get into this one, we will host it again. Um, on the table in the, uh, in the foyer is free buns. We had a bunch of leftover hot dog buns. So please take those. They will go bad if they're left here. So if you can use a package of hot dog buns, please take them. And we have a couple things for sale at the coffee shop. Um, I forgot to grab one. We have well coffee cups. So they're really kind of cute. Um, they are for sale for $5. Um, they're black and they got green on the inside, so they're kind of cute. Um, you can pick that up for again for five dollars at the coffee shop, and then we have um, Texas Roadhouse peanuts. Those are a fundraiser for the youth group for the youth mission trips. So those are three dollars, and they come with a free appetizer for Texas Roadhouse. We have a bunch of those, so please, um, if you like peanuts or like Texas Roadhouse, go grab yours. Um, at this time, we're going to release our Children for Kids Church. So kids from birth all the way up through eighth grade, you guys can go on back and have a great day. It's going to be a fun time. At this time, we're going to bring up Pastor Ryan, who, by the way, I will tell you, he lost at Cornhole. He had one game, they got their butts whooped, so that practice didn't really seem to pay off. That's, that's kind of true, Katie, that's true. It's, but I just want to say that I, my first game we lost, but we lost to the people that eventually played in the championship, and then they lost. So, you know, I feel like I played pretty good, even though we didn't score any points that game. That game was over pretty quick. But anyway, on a brighter note, we won the other two games uh, pretty solidly. But anyway, it was a good time. We appreciate everybody who made that event happen and worked really hard on that. So thanks for doing that. I'm sure the youth are very appreciative that um, hopefully they won't have to hitchhike all the way to New Orleans and back, that they can have enough gas money to get there. So anyway, thanks for coming to being a part. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and just continue on in our series today. Uh, we're, we're talking about how to defeat your giants. And we started a series last week, um, and we were giving you one step each week on what to do on how to defeat your giants. So I'll do a quick recap of last week, and then we'll get into where we need to go today to give you the next step. Uh, but we started looking at the story of David and Goliath, obviously the most popular and famous story about a giant, especially in the Bible. And we said that giants come in all shapes and sizes, that they, they come in a variety of forms in different times of our life. And we gave you examples of some common giants in our life. You can have some health giants, you could have some relational giants, a financial giant, uh, some emotional giants, a, um, a mental giant. We could have a number of different giants that we deal with or can deal with on a regular basis. And we said that um, they come and go. Giants come and go. It feels like sometimes our giants are here for a long time or that they're never going to leave or we're never going to get victory of them. But giants absolutely come and go. And we talked about um, the story of David and Goliath and how Goliath was on the battlefield for 40 days. He'd come out twice a day and he would taunt and he would hurl insults and he would yell at, at the Israelites. And we talked about how that could be a lot of things in our life. You know, what does our life look like when we're facing a giant? And, and we, we kind of described a lot of different things, but we said peaceful is probably not one of the things that we would use to describe our life when a giant is present. But we looked at Matthew chapter 5 and it said, blessed are the peace, what? 
peacemakers, for they are called the sons of God. And we talked about the difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. And a peacekeeper will keep the peace at all costs. It, it, it will not fight. It will, it will give up land. It will give up inheritance. It will give up whatever it needs to give up in order to keep peace. But a peacemaker is different. A peacemaker understands that sometimes in order to broker peace, you have to go to war. Sometimes in order to broker peace, you have to go to the battlefield and confront your giant. And so we said that you'll never have peace in your life until what? Come on, guys. It's in you. Until you decide to do something about it, right? You guys were here for that, right? You'll never have peace in your life until you decide to do something about it. And we said step one in defeating your giant is you have to make a decision to confront your giant. You have to make a decision that no longer will I tolerate this giant in my life. No longer will I allow it to talk and do all the things it does. I will get off of the sidelines and move to the front lines because I'm going to make a decision to take the head off of this giant. And so we begin to give you some t tools and some suggestions. And one of the things that we talked about last week is don't focus on what you can't do. Focus on what you can do. And the giant is very much interested in making sure that you know what you can't do. But you need to make sure that you focus on what you can do. And so we gave you some, inter some different suggestions. And so step one to defeat your giant is decide to go to war. Decide that you're going to confront whatever the giant is in your life and begin to do the things that you can do to confront that giant. So today we're going to go back to the text. So if you have your Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we'll give you, we'll pick up the story where we left off. We're going to read a fair chunk of this story and then draw some uh, principles out of it. So second chan or I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse 4, it says this. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself, and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be your servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So let's begin to kind of go through this passage and put it together and, and create the backstory of what's happening so we get an idea of what we're facing when we're facing a giant. And so the first part of this, it says that, um, giant, that, that he's a giant. They're talking about Goliath. He's a giant. So how big of a giant is he? Now we know that he was tall. The Bible tells us that he was a seasoned champion. Now, I'm, it doesn't say what kind of season champion he was, but I'm assuming he wasn't fresh off of the fair circuit with all of his blue ribbons for apple pies and quilts. I don't think it's that kind of champion. I feel like he's a seasoned, battle-hardened warrior that he knows... 50 different ways to kill somebody. We can do it fast, we can do it slow, we can do it painful, we can get this over with. I feel like he has a number of ways to inflict pain on somebody or to intimidate people. Like That's what I feel the kind of champion he is when he says that he's a champion. Now he goes on and it says that he was a giant and it gives us the height. It says that he was um, six cubics in a span. Well, how big is that? It's really big. Nine feet. Very good. Most biblical scholars, depending on which type of cubit you're looking at and what type of span, he, they say that he's somewhere between eight foot nine inches and nine foot nine inches. So this guy's almost ten feet tall. He says he's from Gath. What's so popular about Gath? Actually, it's interesting because Gath is known to be a community where giants live. 
Like Gath was known to produce giants. And bonus points for anybody who can tell me which race of giant comes from Gath. The Anakim. The Anakim race of giants come from Gath. Can anybody tell me who the father of the Anakim race was? Anak. Very good. For bonus points, how many of you can tell me where we find Anak at in the Bible other than 1 Samuel 17? All right. Good job. So they found him in the promised land right before Israel is crossing the Jordan to go possess the promised land. They're the giants that they saw when they spied out the land. It was the giants of the Anakim race. And so we'll show you that here in a little bit later. It's going to come into the story here in a little bit. So we know that Goliath is a tall man, almost 10 feet tall. We know that he's a giant, that he's probably from the, he's probably from the race of the Anakim giant. He's a big boy. So let's talk about his his armor for just a second. His armor, the Bible says that his helmet was made of brass. And most scholars believe that that style of helmet probably weighed around 15 pounds. Can you imagine wearing a 15-pound hat? Like, that's a lot of weight on your head. But he had probably 15 pounds on his head. The Bible says that his coat of mail was 5,000 shekels of brass. That's around 125 pounds. Imagine wearing a shirt that weighed 125 pounds on top of a hat that weighed almost 50 pounds. That's a lot of weight adding up pretty quick. And then it talks about his bronze armor on his legs. And so they were basically these really large shin guards. And most scholars believe that each one weighed about 30 pounds. And so he has 60 pounds on his legs on top of the 125 pound shirt on top of his 15 pound helmet. And then it goes and he's talking about his spear. And it says that the staff alone from his spear was like a weaver's beam. Now, I did the research, and actually you can find the average length of a biblical weaver's beam. Google it. And it's actually 26 feet long. So this guy's so the staff or the, the, the shaft of his sword or spear is 26 feet long. And so for reference... Um, for an entirely different reason this week, I had to measure how far the projector is from the screen. And it's 16 feet. So from the projector to the screen is 16 feet. So add another 10 feet to that, and that's the length of Goliath's spear. And they think that weighed around 17 pounds. And then it said that the spearhead was like 6, 600 shekels of iron, which is around 37 pounds just in the spearhead. Now, we don't have any idea how much his sword um, weighed or how big it was. We do know that David used it to cut his head off and then save the sword. That's a pretty good souvenir from that moment in life, don't you think? He saved that sword to remind him of what God did. And then the Bible says that he had a, uh, an armor bear, someone that went out ahead of him and carried his sword. Now, it doesn't tell us how big the sword was, but I mean, can you imagine a guy that's 10 feet tall or almost 10 feet tall that's got a massive sword, a massive spear, who's probably really muscled and ripped, and he's hurling insults at you? How many of you want to fight him? I don't. Like, biblical scholars believe that Goliath could have had as much as five to 700 pounds of armor on when he faced Goliath. That's crazy. But, you know, I think our giants in our life look a lot like that sometimes. You know, when, with, imagine if you're seeing Goliath on the battlefield for the first time, and he's got his sword and his spear and his helmet, and he's decked out in all of his armor. What are you thinking about right now? That's, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? I wouldn't want to go up against him. And I think sometimes when we see our giants, we can have some really similar thoughts go through our head like, this is impossible. There is no way that I can overcome this giant in my life. There's no real answer to the thing that's in front of me. You see, there's no real effective strategy on how to deal with this giant. And how many of you know that sometimes, many times, God's strategy to deal with your giants is anything but effective in the, from a natural point of view? Like, out of all of the military men that, is, that Saul had at his disposal, all the, the bright minds of his day, they couldn't come up with a solution to Goliath. They had 40 days to do something. 
I mean, at least try building a Trojan horse or something. Like, like they had nothing. What was their answer? I'm going to send a shepherd boy with no armor, a slingshot, and a handful of stones. Like, who says that's a good idea? Like, who wants to put the, the, the hopes of victory into that scenario? You want to play those Vegas odds? No, it's horrible. But that's the way God answers our issues with our giants. But I think many times we look at our giants in our life and we feel overwhelmed or we feel outgunned or unprepared or we feel like defeat is certain that we're never going to get through this. And so I don't think Goliath is all that different from the giants that we face in our own life. Now let's go back and look at the message of the giant because let's be honest, your giant has a certain message as well. So let's go back and look at the giant's message in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 8. It says this, talking about Goliath, He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Well, this doesn't really have a whole lot of meaning to us until we actually back up and get a little bit more information. So hold your place in your Bible at this, but turn back a couple chapters to 1 Samuel chapter 13. There's a really important piece of information you need to understand what, what Goliath is really saying here. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, starting in verse 19, it says this, There were no blacksmiths in Israel. And the Philistines would not allow them because they were afraid the Israelites would make iron swords and spears. Only the Philistines could sharpen iron tools. So if the Israelites needed to sharpen their plows, hoes, axes, or sickles, they had to go to the Philistines. Now with that piece of information, let's jump back into the message of the giant. And he says in verse 8, Eight of chapter 17, he stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? You see, what is Goliath saying right here? He's saying, I know you don't have any good weapons because you don't have any blacksmiths. I know you have no effective weapons against us because we won't allow you to build any. You see, all of these years, you've had to come to us to get things sharpened. I know you don't have anything for this battle. You see, I know the weapons that I have, that the Philistines have, are far superior to anything that you have because you don't have anybody that can make you any weapons. He's saying, why have you come here? Why have you drawn up in battle formation? Because everybody knows it's a joke. Everybody knows you're not going to win. Everybody knows you're really not an army. And that everybody knows that you don't have the heart for the fight. Man, you're already defeated. Man, you're never going to win against me. And you're never going to win against the Philistines. He's telling them, you're nobody. Your future is bleak. It's hopeless. Why are you even going to fight? And then he says, you're just servants of Saul. That's all you are. He says, I'm a Philistine. I'm a giant. He's going, am I not bigger than you? Am I not better than you? And am I not more equipped than you? I'm stronger than you. I'm more experienced than you. I can, I've got more battle experience. I can win this fight five different ways. Why are you even on the battlefield? Because you don't even have the right weapons for this battle. And then he makes it fun of his leader. He goes, you're just servants of Saul. You're just servants. Your leader's having some problems right now. And your leader is, is, is mentally having some challenges. He's got a lot of issues going on in his life. He's dropped his guard. God's yanked the kingdom from him. God's anointed a new king. Why are you following a guy that's preoccupied with other things and you don't even have any weapons? You see, that was the message of the giant. You see, your giant probably has a very similar message. You see, your giant is probably telling you something like this. Why are you even fighting me? Why are you even trying to fight? You don't have any weapons. Do you think God's going to answer your prayers? Do you think God's going to come through for you? Do you really think that you are more than a conqueror? God's not going to come through for you. Man, you're too messed up to win this fight. 
Man, your life is too far gone for you to care about this victory or this fight. Man, this is never going to change for you. Besides, what's one victory really going to prove? Maybe your giant's saying, you know, it's just too little too late. You see, the giant still talks today, doesn't he? He still says a lot of similar things that Goliath says. You see, step one to defeat your giant is you got to make a decision to fight your giant. But step two is you got to stop listening to the voice of your giant. You see, if you're going to defeat your giant, you got to stop listening to that voice. I mean, you got to tell that giant to shut up. That he doesn't know what he's talking about. That giant is not for you. That giant wants to see you lose. He's not going to encourage you. He's not going to tell you the truth. Let's look at your track record. How many of you have had a lot of bad days in your life? Either we got liars or a lot of unexperienced people in this room. How many of you hit rock bottom at some point in your life? How many of you have ever had a bad day and it literally killed you? <laughs> Two. <laughs> My point is this. You have a 100% track record of making it through every bad day and every rock bottom time in life. The giant lies to you. He lies to you. He is not telling you the truth. So if you're going to confront your giant, then you have to stop listening to him. He's not going to tell you the truth. Because you know what happens when you listen to the giant? You get scared. Let's go back and look at our verse. In verse uh, 11, 1 Samuel 17, verse 11, it says, Saul and the Israelite soldiers heard what Goliath said, and they were what? Very afraid. You see, when you start listening to the voice of your giant, that's when fear comes in. And I, this, you, when, you, when you get stuck, you get what? Stupid. Sometimes when you get scared, you get what? Stupid. You do dumb stuff. You believe dumb stuff. You say dumb stuff. You, you act in dumb ways. And it's not because you don't love God. It's because you listen to the wrong voice. Stop listening to your giant. It's not for you. And let's be honest, our, our giant voices can come in a lot of different ways, can't they? Man, they can come, like you really may have an authentic enemy in your life. Someone that does not want good for you. Man, you may have a boss or a coworker that's making your job really difficult. They may be trying to run you out of a job. They may be trying to put pressure on you. That may be a giant in your life. You may have somebody who wants to see your business go under. You may have somebody who's spreading lies about your character or your business or your integrity. You may have a giant that is really out there. How many of you have, have had giant voices like that? Some of you. Good. Stop listening to the voice. You know, you can have people in your life, you can have giant voices in your life from people that really want the best for you, but don't understand the call and the grace that's on your life. You know, it happens in the church all the time when people don't understand what God's called you to do, and they don't understand the grace that's on your life, or the call that's on your life, or the thing that God's called you to do, and they, they're, they, they're well-meaning people, but they'll tell you, you shouldn't do that. God hasn't called you to that. Don't step out and do that. That's a mistake, and the, they'll try to keep you on the sidelines when God's called you to the front lines. Sometimes the giant voice comes from our, our past, from past mistakes. Sometimes the voice of the giant says, don't open your heart up again. You know what happened last time. Man, don't believe for too much. I don't want you to get your heart broken again. Man, don't step out in faith. You know Last time you stepped out in faith, you know, the, the earth was, was closed up and the heavens were, were bronze and the earth was iron. God didn't answer any of your prayers. He didn't show up. Don't step out in faith again. Man, you know what happened last time that you did this? You see, that's the voice of the giant. Maybe it's the voice from the past. Maybe it's something from your childhood. And man, that voice still just talks to you today. 
Man, that voice is there saying, man, you're a screw up. Man, nobody likes you. Nobody liked you from the start. Nobody wanted you. Look, this is why you're having all these problems. That's the voice of the giant. Man, maybe the giant's voice is from a failed marriage. It's all your fault. Or, man, if you would have just done this or done that, you wouldn't be in this position right now. Stop listening to the giant. Man, it could be a business failure. It could be a, a, a business that went under. It could be a relational dysfunction somehow. There's a lot of different voices out there from the giant. And maybe it's a voice of a teacher or a parent that will always talk down on you. They always assume the worst. They always, you know, always accuse you of something and you still hear the voice of the giant. Let's be honest for just a minute. Sometimes the voice of the giant just lives in our own head, doesn't it? Like I think sometimes we don't say the kindest things to ourselves, do we? I would love to sit up here and tell you that every day I wake up and the, the dominant voice in my head is, you're awesome. Like, you just rock. Like, like, I wish I could get up Monday morning and be like, that was a great sermon you did yesterday. Like, everybody loved that. Like, like you, you are destined for greatness in preaching. Like, 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 I wish that was the dominant voice in my head. But let's be honest, it isn't always the dominant voice in my head. And it's probably not the dominant voice in your head either. If we're honest, maybe the dominant voice in our head sounds more like this. God, you're so stupid. Man, why, why didn't you see that coming? How, how could you be so blind and not know that that was what was going to happen? You're such a loser. Or, you know, like you do something stupid and you're like, idiot. Like, I mean, what's wrong with me? You guys ever have those thoughts? Just me? Great, great. They're like, man, you screwed up again. Or the voice that says, man, God's disappointed in you. Dot, 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 dot. Again. Dot, 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 dot. No big surprise. You see, sometimes we're not the kindest to ourselves with what we say to ourselves. You see, you have to stop listening to the voice of your giant. And I want to show you the tactic of the giant because the tactic is always the same. They, only ha they have a very few tactics, and they do the same thing over and over and over again. And I told you that the Anakim giants were going to come back into play in the story again. And so I want you to turn over to your Bibles to Numbers chapter 13. And this is the story when the spies went out into the promised land. And they spied it out for 40 days, and they came back. And they begin to give the report of what happened. And so I want to read the report. And starting in verse 25, it says this. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kedesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified, and we and are very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there, that's the Anakim giants, and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell in the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once. And occupy it, for we are able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land and the spies and, and they lamb that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that were in there of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who came from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so seemed to them. 
You see, there's two groups of people in the spies. There's Joshua and Caleb, which are the two that are willing to go fight the giants. They're willing to defeat their giant, to confront them. They're willing to get off of the sidelines and go to the front lines. But you see, the difference between the two spies and the ten spies is two of them didn't listen to the voice of the giant. Two of them were willing to fight and not listen to the voice. The other ten weren't willing to fight and had listened to the wrong voice. And do you see when you start listening to the wrong voice that you get stupid? You begin to make stupid mistakes and stupid things come out of your mouth? Because here's what came out of their mouth. The ten says, the land devours its inhabitants. Is that not a dumb statement? Think about that. Is that even a true statement? The land devours its inhabitants. There's no truth in that at all. The Hittites are there. The Jebusites are there. The Amalekites are there. The Hittites. All these ites and tites and Canaanites and whatever, they're all there. So if the land devours the people, then why are they all there? They're not all giants. You see, they listen to the wrong voice and they begin to get stupid theology. They begin to get stupid belief systems. They begin to think that they couldn't do the very thing that God had called them to do because they listened to the wrong voice. They could see what was available to them. They saw the great fruit and and how big the produce was and, and the blessing that was in the land. But they were willing to forego the blessing because they weren't willing to confront their giant. And I think the same is true for us today. Many times we're willing to forego the blessing that God wants to release to us because we're not willing to confront the giant. We'd rather listen. Think about how stupid this is. We'd rather listen to the voice of the giant than listen to the voice of God. We think the giant actually has truth in what it tells us. He lies. The giant's not going to tell you the truth. The giant doesn't want you in the land. He doesn't want you to experience the blessing or the inheritance or the fruit or whatever it is that God wants to give you. Stop listening to the voice. You see, when you listen to the voice, you actually begin to see yourself in a way that God never intended for you to see yourself. You see, the 10 said, they see us like grasshoppers and so we are. You see, the the message that your giant gives you is of one of defeat, smallness, insignificant. You see, Goliath was like, who are you? You don't even have any weapons. You're not even a real army. You don't even have anyone to make you weapons. Your leader, the king, King Saul, he's a hot mess. Like, 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 you don't even know what's going on. He's calling them out, saying, you're nobodies. You don't know what's going on. You can't handle this. The same is true for your giant. You're never going to get this right. It's never. You, you, who are you to fight for your marriage? Or who are you to think that you could ever get free of, of this mental illness issue or this problem? Is that what God would tell you? Absolutely not. You see, when you listen to the voice of your giant, you listen to the wrong voice and fear comes in. So let me give you a couple of steps, a couple of verses to help combat the message of the giant. And the first one is this. Man, get in touch with your identity. Let me tell you what, the giant is not going to give you your true identity. He's not going to, your giant is not yelling at you, you are more than a conqueror right now. He's telling you, you're a loser. You see, your identity is this, that you are more than a conqueror. Your identity is goodness and mercy does follow you all the days of your life. Zechariah, or, uh, Zephaniah says that we're called to be prisoners of hope. And the whole idea is that you're, you have a ball and chain and you just drag hope with you everywhere that you go. So when you come onto the battlefield to confront your giant, man, you're not a prisoner of hopelessness. You're a prisoner of hope. You just bring hope with you everywhere that you go. Your identity is that God does have a plan for your life. He has a plan for your future, and it's a plan to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you what? Hope and a future. Not to give you hopelessness, not to give you defeat, but to give you hope, to give you a good future. You're called to live, to dwell in the land, and to prosper. Your identity is is that every weapon that your giant forms against you will not prosper. That God turns everything around for your good, including food poisoning. 
Yeah. Start listening to the right voice. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus says this, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So let me help you understand this. You can't go listen to what God has to say about you once, because it's probably not going to take. You see, when you're on the battlefield and you're confronting your giant, that's when you need to go every day and go, God, remind me of who I am. Because let me tell you what, the giant's going to make sure that you won't get connected with who you really are. So you need to get connected to the right voice, and God will tell you who you are in every season of your life. And it's not a leader, and it's not an idiot, and it's not defeated, and it's not hopelessness. That is not who you are. But you won't ever get your true identity if you don't stop listening to the voice of your giant. Next one is this. This is tough. This is the tough one. You have to be committed to living a life of faith. You're, you're a faith being before you are anything else. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. For we walk by what? Faith, not by sight. I have to be more influenced by what I see here than what I see here. You see, I can't let the battlefield of the natural influence who I am in the supernatural. Supernatural means above the natural. So my identity resides in the supernatural, so I have to live from a place of supernatural acceptance in God so I can actually influence my situation in the natural. You see, it's super easy to look at the battlefield and be like, you know what, the giant's right. I am a grasshopper. The giant's right. I have a, a past that says I'm a screw-up and a failure and I can't handle money or relationships or I can't handle stress or I can't handle whatever. The giant's right. I'll tell you what, the giant's wrong. Stop listening to your giant. And lastly, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Now, I, I'm a little bit hesitant to say this because I don't want anybody to take it the wrong way, but there's like the good kind of fear. You know what I mean? Like, you know, there's a snake and I need to distance myself from the snake. You guys know what I'm talking about? That's the good kind of fear. Snakes are bad, right? Distance between snakes, good. And there's, a, there's a healthy fear that God put inside of us to keep us safe. But then there's the unhealthy fear f- from listening to the giant that causes us to think stupid and to act stupid and to not to do the right thing. So in, not any time, but many times, okay, every time you encounter fear, you need to first ask yourself, is this healthy fear or is this fear because I've listened to the wrong voice? Because God did not give me a spirit of fear. So anytime I encounter fear, I automatically know that this is not from God, assuming there's no snake involved. Okay, you guys with me? And don't super spiritualize this. We're like, the snake was in the garden, so. No, like, like you guys tracking with me? I don't want people to misunderstand what I have to say because I need that voice tomorrow to tell me that I did a good job today. You guys with me? Okay, all right. So, so when you encounter fear, ask yourself, where did this fear come from? Did this come from me listening to my giant? Or did this come because God's like, hey, knucklehead, pay attention. I'm trying to help you out here. This is a healthy fear. And only you can get to determine that. But man doesn't live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So if you're not sure what kind of fear it is, you should go back to step two, which is what? Listening to what God has to say. See, defeating your giant's not that hard. You just have to take it one step at a time. So step one is choose to fight. Step two is choose to stop listening to the voice of your giant and start listening to the voice of the giant killer. Listen to what God has to say about you. So I'm going to close this in prayer, and I want to challenge you this week to ask yourself, what voices am I listening to? What giants are in my life, and what have I listened to them? What's the message that the giant in my life is telling me? And I want you to begin to choose to confront that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the day. God, I thank you that everyone in this room has been called to be a giant killer. Everyone in this room is going to have a story on how you took the head off of their giant. And so, God, we just release courage and faith. 
We release boldness to the people to get off of the sidelines and run to confront their giant. But God, we ask that you would give everybody a supernatural ability to stop listening to the voice of their giant. That they'll start listening to what you have to say about them. That they'll live from a place of faith. That they'll be prisoners of hope and they drag hope everywhere with them. That they'll begin to look at their giant and say that you're a nobody. That all giants fall. And it's just a matter of time until this giant begins to fall in my life. But until then, I refuse to listen to the voice of my giant. I refuse to listen to the, the past mistakes I've had, the failures that the voices in my head tell me that I am, that I will choose to cultivate a relationship with God and let him tell me who I am. God, I thank you for what you're doing in the lives of the people. I ask that you bless them and encourage them. In Jesus' name, amen.